you're probably wondering, um, well, you're, pro you're probably wondering that, that somebody can actually make a career out of studying uh, parasites. In uh, fact, you can. Uh, I've actually been studying parasites for uh, for about 20 years, and I'm actually I'm slow. I'm probably next year I'll be reaching a milestone where um, I'll, I have been studying parasites longer than not. Um, so, like I said, I've been studying for for over um, for over 20 years. So, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a little a brief introduction of, uh, of parasites, a little bit of introduction on the history of parasitology. And, uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the research that we're doing at UOIT to uh, discover new antiparasitic drugs. So, uh, so with that, uh, maybe we'll, we'll start with uh, a brief definition of a parasite. And if you go into the literature, if you do a web search, um, you probably will come across variations in the definition of, of a parasite. Um, you may know a person that you think is a parasite. He may work with somebody. <laughs> that is a parasite, but the actual definition in a biological sense, um, if you think about parasites, parasitism is actually a symbiotic relationship. And a parasite you can define as an organism that lives either in or on another organism of a different species and uses that organism for some part of their life cycle, some metabolic uh, reason. Now parasites can come in a wide variety of different forms. There's actually, uh, there, there's worm parasites, and so what you're looking at here is, uh, is, a, is a parasitic worm, a parasitic helmet. This is Schistosoma mansoni. And uh, what you're seeing, you probably guessed, you're actually looking at two parasites right here. The larger one right here is the male parasite, and the slender one right here is the female parasite. So this female parasite actually sits in what's called the gynecophoral canal of the male parasite. And uh, what they do is they mate, female lays eggs. Um, this parasite, uh, it infects humans. It, uh, it can actually live in the hepatic portal vein of humans, and they can live uh, for about seven years. Uh, so it's a very, very serious parasite. What you're seeing here is another parasite, but this is a protozoan parasite. This is the parasite called plasmodium, the causative agent of malaria. And what you're seeing here is a blood smear, and here is the, the parasitic organism there. And also, if you think of parasites, not many people think of ectoparasites, lice and things like that as parasites, but they actually are. This is an image of a, of a lice parasite. Now the history of parasitology is actually, parasitology is a very interesting history. And uh, actually it, it, parasitology and parasitic investigation, things like that, have, has a very, very early history. And you can actually trace parasitology back to the ancient Egyptian medical document called the Abers Papyrus back in 1500 BC. There's actually some descriptions of parasitic diseases. Um, they've actually, there's been documentation that they've actually found uh, helmet eggs in uh, Egyptian mum mummies in uh, 1200 BC. And many scholars um, have actually, they've, it's been widely accepted that uh, the fiery serpents that you read about in the Old Testament are actually of guinea worm. Guinea worm is a parasitic nematode. And this is actually a 17th century depiction of uh, some, some Persian doctors that, that are tr trying to remove guinea worm from the legs of patients. So if he's, if it's really hard to see, this is an older document, but here is basically the, the doctor uh, re trying to remove guinea worm from the leg uh, of patients. And basically the treatment at the time was simply, as soon as the nematode emerged from the leg, that you would basically have um, a small stick and you would gently wrap the worm around the stick over sometimes hours, sometimes days, and eventually the worm can be removed from the, the leg. So I know, pretty creepy. Uh, it's a good thing that you're actually listening to this, uh, you know, you have a, about an hour before lunch, so, um, so you guys picked a good time to come here. Um, so, and another interesting fact, and actually guinea worm, uh, one thing about guinea worm is that it's, uh, it's near eradication, so that's a good thing. And, um, and the modern day medical symbol uh, that you see here, where you see a staff with some serpents wrapped around uh, the stick there, some scholars have actually, th actually think that this is a depiction of the treatment of guinea worm. Uh, so some interesting history there. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, uh, instead of going into a lot of detail, because we only have, we can only scratch the surface today, uh, I would introduce about six parasites, uh, talk a little bit about life cycles and a little bit about the research that we're doing here. So just to give, we'll do the fast six, you can call it. So this is an image of a tapeworm. 
uh, called D. caninum. This is basically the, pro the prototypical uh, parasite. Uh, people think of parasites, they think of tapeworms. So here is uh, the, the image of the tapeworm. These sections that you see here are what's called proglottids. These are the, these are filled with eggs, and this is, uh, this is used actually to, uh, to propagate the, the parasite life cycle. This is an image of the head region called the scolex, and this region here actually attaches to the intestine. Humans can become infected with this particular parasite by ingesting inflect, infected fleas. Uh, here's one. Uh, this is of a parasitic nematode. It's a fairly large parasite called Ascaris lumbricoides. Uh, you can see there's a ruler there, so you can, base, you can see very well how large this parasite is. Uh, and here's the head region uh, of the parasite. Uh, this infects many people, particularly in developing countries. Humans are infected by ingesting the infective egg stage. And once inside your body, the adult parasites can live in the intestine for about one to two years. Um, I can see the faces, by the way. <laughs> here's another one called uh, Acaninum. Uh, this, this is the, of the, obviously the head region right here. You can see the sharp structures of the head region. Uh, you call them teeth. Uh, if you want, but these worms, uh, they, they can actually penetrate the skin. So if you're walking, uh, if you don't have shoes on, if you're walking, not particularly in Canada, again, more in developing countries, but these worms penetrate the skin, can make their way to the small intestine. And basically what happens is the parasite will latch on to your small intestine. And these parasites, one particular, one parasite can drink about 0.3 mils of blood per day. So if you can just imagine if you have a very severe infection, a high intense infection, um, you can lose a lot of blood with this parasite. Um, here's one that's mostly uh, asymptomatic. This is, um, this is pinworm. Uh, a lot of people have heard about pinworm. Pinworm, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's prevalent to a certain extent in Canada and North America. Um, and basically, it's mostly asymptomatic and is prevalent uh, in preschool children. So you can just imagine the route of exposure to this particular parasite. If you have a, a child in, um, uh, that's with some other children playing, the child scratches their bum, plays with a toy. We're all taught to share, right? So that the toy gets shared with another uh, child. The child, what, what the child is going to do is put the, put the uh, toy in, in the mouth. And that's the route of exposure for this particular parasite. Like I said, it's mostly asymptomatic, very readily treated. Here is uh, one that you may not think of as a parasite. It's, uh, it's bed bugs, and it's mostly, they're mostly uh, uh, itchy annoyance, um, and uh, they're not very pretty, obviously. Um, and here's the last one I'll just introduce. This is uh, of a liver fluke. Here's the size of it. They're fairly large, and uh, humans become uh, infected uh, accidentally. And basically what happens is the parasite will make their way to the uh, liver and the biliary ducts, and they can live for a certain amount of time. Now, just, just to switch gears a little bit and talk to, talk to you about some of the more serious aspects of parasitology. And parasitic diseases actually fall within a larger umbrella of diseases called tropical diseases. And um, there are tropical, and tropical diseases are found mostly in developing countries in tropical, subtropical areas. Um, there are actually tropical diseases that receive the most attention. And uh, it's not surprising, these are very well known tropical diseases such as tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, AIDS. These are referred to in some cases as the big three. However, there's, a, there's other tropical diseases out there that most parasites actually fall under. And these have been, um, these have been named by the World Health Organization as the neglected tropical diseases. They don't receive as much funding, as much attention as the big three, but they're still very, very serious. And there's actually initiative by the World Health Organization as well as other organizations to try to eradicate a lot of these neglected tropical diseases. But just to give you some numbers, um, try, if you just talk, take a look at parasites, and in particular parasitic, parasitic nematodes, Parasitic nematodes actually infect 1.5 billion people. So if you think that's an enormous number given the amount of people on the planet Earth. So these particular diseases infect almost 2 billion people. Okay? And in a lot of cases, these parasites do not necessarily cause death. But the import, one of the more important aspects of, of these parasites is that they can co cause severe disability. And I'll give you some, just to give you an appreciation of the disability that can occur through parasitic infections. So here is, uh, here's some images 
Uh, here, the one, the one that you're looking at here, these are, uh, this is an image of villagers in Africa that have been blinded by uh, Onchocercovolvulus. Onchocercovolvulus is a parasitic nematode, and what happens is the larval stage of the parasite migrates to the eye, and, uh, and that, that causes the, the blindness, and you can see them uh, being led probably back to the village uh, via a rope. Um, this particular parasite is also referred to as river blindness. And the reason is because um, the, the people that normally become infected have spent a, a, large, number, a, a, a large amount of time near fast-flowing uh, waterways um, because they become exposed because this, these are breeding grounds uh, of the black fly, which transmits the disease. So it's also referred to as river blindness. This is a, another image of a villager with, uh, with a condition called elephantiasis. This is actually caused by a, a group of parasit parasitic nematodes that infect the lymphatic system. And what happens is, they, uh, they cause a swelling or edema, and uh, in a lot of cases, the, the people that with elephantiasis, they're often shunned by their village. And, uh, and the last one here is a child uh, that's been affected with schistosomiasis, and you can see the, one, one of the, one of the uh, symptoms of uh, schistosomiasis is a, in a large abdomen. So very, very, very serious, but again, there's, uh, there's a lot of initiatives out there trying to eradicate um, uh, parasitic diseases and the burden of parasitic diseases. One interesting thing I just want to want to highlight is uh, whenever you study parasitology, and I took a course actually in high, in um, university called parasitology, you often um, you often learn the life cycles of these organisms because they're very very interesting. Parasites have evolved a very very unique way of getting inside you after they find you, and they've evolved the means to actually travel through your body and evade the immune system. I just want to highlight one particular. Uh, life cycle, and this is of Schistosoma mansoni, the example I, I, I gave you in the first slide. And we'll start with um, we'll start with the intermediate host. So this particular parasite has what's called an intermediate host, and the intermediate host is called a snail. And the parasite will first infect the snail, and will go through a developmental process within the snail. And basically, what will happen is what will emerge from this particular snail is this stage right here. And this stage right here, you can see uh, very clearly the stage has a tail, so obviously it swims. And what will happen is the, this particular uh, larval stage is a very good swimmer, and it's actually able to detect humans that have gone into the waters for whatever reason, bathing, washing clothes, and things like that. Um, and they will actually detect the human and penetrate their skin. Okay? One of the things, the next thing that happens with this particular parasite is that once it penetrates the skin, once it gets its head inside the skin, it loses its tail, okay? Like I said, I'm trying to creep you out a little bit, not too much, but a little bit. So it loses its tail and becomes this particular stage right here called the schistosomulae. This particular stage right here has a, has a movement like an inchworm, so it will digest its way through tissue, will find a blood vessel, will travel through the blood vessel and make their way to the liver and then mature into adult male and female worms. So very, very interesting. Um, one thing, uh, another thing to note about, uh, about parasites and that there's a few examples of parasites that are, alt that are able to alter the behavior of their host. And one uh, really good example is this particular parasite right here. Um, it, it's called D. dendriticum. And the larval stage of the parasite um, will infect uh, an intermediate host, and the intermediate host in this case is the ant. And what will happen is the larval stage will make their way to the ant's brain, and it will cause the ant to climb onto blades of grass or other vegetation. Um, and the reason is because it allows the ants to be more exposed to eating by cows or, and other warm-blooded animals. So it makes, uh, the parasite is actually forcing the ant to go into the final host. And it does that through altering the behavior uh, of, of, of the intermediate host called the ant. Now, why do I study parasites? Uh, well, there's a number of reasons, as you can imagine. Um, the, the first reason is that they are a very important human health co concern. Um, and like I said, mostly when we're talking about human health, what we're talking about is mostly developing countries. Okay. However, in Canada, parasites can be a, a burden to domestic animals, your companion animals, dogs and cats, or our livestock. So they're a very, very serious organism worldwide, and, um, and obviously we have to find ways to control them. They're also interesting organisms. OK? 
Okay? It's, uh, you know, there's not, uh, you know, I, I chose this field of, of study because of the interest and the importance of, of, of parasites. And one of the interesting aspects about parasites is that they've evolved a unique ways of finding their host. And once they've found their host and they're inside their host, they've developed the means to evade the immune system. And that is very, very interesting. And this is some of the research that I was doing at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, what you're seeing here is, uh, is a cross section or a longitudinal section of a schistosoma mansoni parasite. And this brown staining right here is uh, where we've detected a certain receptor. And what we think is that the receptor that's found on the surface of the worm is able to receive molecules from the host to know where, it's, where it is in the host and possibly to evade the immune system. So ver parasites, as long as there been, there's been humans, parasites have infected them and uh, have evolved uh, over, over many, many years. Um, the, recent, some of my, the recent research in my lab uh, were actually focused on trying to understand the nervous system of, of parasites because what we want to do is we want to find a target. We want to find a new target that could possibly be developed into a new antiparasitic drug. And um, so we've been doing uh, so, some work on understanding the nervous system of, of parasitic nematodes. So what you're seeing here is, is an image uh, of uh, where we've detected serotonin. Now serotonin is an important neurotransmitter. It's, it's, it's found in our brain. It plays an important role in the function of our brain. But it's also, serotonin is al also found in parasitic worms. And then this image right here, this glowing area right here, is where we've detected a receptor. And this receptor is found on the pharynx. So this is uh, the means at which the parasites feed. So we've detected a receptor that could possibly be exploited in the future to, to develop a new antiparasitic drug. Um, this is one target that we think uh, is very, very promising, and we, we've been able to develop a three-dimensional model of this particular receptor right here, and uh, we're actually uh, doing uh, quite a bit of research to try to understand this particular receptor. And just to, just to give you an idea of what the, some of the experience um, that students can have at UOIT, uh, a lot of the work, um, I'm no longer in the lab uh, myself, um, a lot of the work that, that, that's done now is, is by my students, and they're either graduate students or even undergraduate students. Um, so the students are the ones that are doing the research uh, at, at UOIT. So just, uh, just to give you an, an idea, uh, UIT is more, uh, is more than parasitology. We have, uh, we have a very strong group of, 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 of biologists, and uh, some of the biologists that we have are focused uh, primarily on, on teaching, uh, and they, they teach quite a number of courses, whereas the, the others uh, th that you see here, including myself, um, we, we have a research program as well as we teach undergraduate courses. And one of the things about, about UIT is that we've hired professors, faculty that are not only excellent teachers, but also strong researchers. So uh, I'd recommend if you ever have a chance to get to know some of the faculty um, in, in biology and in, and in other disciplines. If you ever have a chance to, to visit UOIT um, and get a chance to tour some of our facilities, we have state-of-the-art facilities for both research as well as uh, undergraduate teaching. And I'll end there, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. <laughs>